Mortimer for a conversation about these three films, but also about the the uh, the entire all the things that you guys share or the or the differences that you've had in your careers um, as actors. And I I wanted to start. I I had just uh, a couple days ago seen Willem. The Criterion Collection has a great short video they do with actors and directors where you go into their a vault and get to pick some movies. Matter of fact, um, Robert Downey Sr. did one of these in 2011. That's right. Um, where he, he talked about Cassavetes and, uh, and Fellini. But Willem just did it last month. And there's a great anecdote you tell in there when you pick out Visconti's The Leopard, which mm. stars Burt Lancaster as a Sicilian Don. And you, you tell us what, what, what you said there. Well, you know, sometimes, sometimes when something, uh, someone proposes something to you, you think, wow, uh, I'm not really right for this. I, I, I don't think it's good casting. You know, yeah. I, I, I shouldn't do this because I'm just not working. I don't have the material to work with, you know? And I'm always reminded when you think about Burt Lancaster, I know him from, you know, the circus movie and kind of uh, goofy, energetic performances. And he's going to work for Visconti to play this elegant uh, Sicilian uh, gentleman. I think, no, bad idea. <laughs> but it works. It works. So I guess I'm struck at uh, a couple of times that I've, I've told people I, I don't think I'm really right to do something. And they talked me into it. It's always uh, worked out. And I think uh, it's interesting that sometimes actors put, um, or at least I do, I can't talk about actors. Mm. uh, I put limitations on myself that I either feel comfortable with things that are very close to my experience. So I feel like I know them so I can go deeper or something that's very far away from experience. And I'm excited to go toward that and learn something. But sometimes... You know, I, I, I just, uh, you anticipate, you anticipate, uh, I guess, result. The, the story is that that that, that kind of self-censorship uh, is crazy. And uh, Burt Lancaster reminded me that, you know, all characters are in you and anything's possible. And it's, uh, your, the characters are revealed through the circumstance and your will. And uh, you can come to them. That's all. Here's my question to you then, sir. Did you feel that way in approaching the monster? Did you feel the monster was far enough away that you were excited about it, or were you trepidatious? You mean you mean in the poor things? Yes, sir. <clears throat> you say monster, and I don't even recognize that because I don't Godwin think of Baxter. Baxter. Yeah. He's, he's there you go. The Baxter. You meant to say the Baxter, Willem. Give him a fucking that, break. That's what I meant. I apologize. <laughs> You know, we're protective of our people sometimes. <laughs> Understood. Understood. No, I no. I listen for that. You know, I don't. Uh, one thing, I don't think about character so much. I think about the people in the situation. Yeah. And when Yorgos and Emma called me, and they basically told me the rough cutout of the story, I said, "Okay." <laughs> I had no, no, really. And also, just a silly personal thing is. Uh, He's a scientist, he's a doctor, he's a, he's a surgeon. Um, and uh, I have that in my background. And somehow there is something sweet about uh, going to that. Most people you know, going to hospitals or being in labs or, you know, is a frightening thing for them. For me, it's like a return to home. It's a comfort, strangely enough. So, yeah, I didn't, I didn't think about, I didn't think about, that's a case where I didn't think about whether I was right for it. I just, it was a, Proposition for an adventure with yeah. people that we admired. It sounded like a cool story, and I was in. That made like you an offer you couldn't refuse. I got you. Yeah. I just made the connection of uh, of uh, Clifford Ellison, also a surgeon. We are a fifty percent medical crew at this uh, Fort <laughs> Cup right now. <laughs> yeah, right. Good one, man. Good one. Well, St- uh, Sterling, you know, yeah. when you're talking about not knowing if you're right for a role. I heard that your manager when. Uh, you got sent the script, said, you know, it's a small part, kind of, and so just was giving you that heads up in advance. Yeah. What was that like to to sort of realize that there really aren't, this is not a small part necessarily, I mean, but also you're, this is the only contemporary set film of the three, although all three movies do address uh, modern ideas. But 
Um, how much did you draw on uh, experience for in order to bring to it? I think there's a lot of uh, experience in terms of me and Cliff. I, I'm the youngest of three siblings. He's the youngest of three siblings. I'm the artist in a group of uh, a family that does more traditional things. So everybody looks at me like I'm the weird one, even though I'm the dude that went to Stanford too. I, I did like weird stuff by going, yeah, I walk around with an S on my chest. And yeah. But <laughs> the, thing, the thing about it is like, like, they were very worried that like, so you decided to go here. I was gonna be an economics major. I was, had an internship at the Federal Reserve Bank. And then I was like, you know what? I made a complete 180. And so folks were like, he may have lost it. So this idea of just sort of trying to be understood by your tribe, that I think everybody sort of experiences to a certain extent, is something that I can relate to with regards to Cliff. And then just being that age, I can't relate to the, my life being blown up by being caught in bed with another man, et cetera. I can, I can imagine, I think, besides life experience, the greatest actor's gift is well, what if, the imagination. And the heartbreak that I would go through when I just think about not being with my children, losing the person who I've shared my life with for 20 plus years, and now being what, what Cliff is a free agent. And most free agents that I meet, when they get separated and they're looking to go fishing and they're looking to bait that hook, they're trying to make themselves look as nice as they possibly can. <laughs> and then they're not concerned about feelings. They just want to get their quote unquote swerve on. And that is where you are finding Cliff <laughs> when we meet him in American fiction. And he doesn't want anybody to tell him how he should live his life because he's been trying to live his life in one particular way for such a long time. Here comes a child. There's a child opening a door. Who's that? Who's opening a door? Come in. Welcome. Stick your head in. This is my <laughs> youngest. I love you. Hey. That's Amari, everybody. Let me finish uh, the room real quick, and how come we'll play some basketball in a second, okay? <laughs> anyway, that's that's what I can relate to. Um, and it was beyond just like the character, it was the importance of the story at large in terms of expanding the swath of Black representation. And there's nothing wrong with the films that I think we've done in terms of slave narratives, of inner city narratives, of overcoming as long as they are not the totality. So when someone else who comes from outside of that experience, I, I, many times I've been told, you're not like a regular black dude. And people mean it with kindness. I'm like, they haven't seen enough in yeah. order to know that what regular is. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to uh, ask Robert about um, Louis Strauss because He's he's not that charismatic a figure. I mean, he's he's a very important historical figure, but you don't you you. I would if I read it, I would think maybe a character actor in his seventies uh, would be the, the 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 choice. But Christopher Nolan, actually, he saw you um, before you kind of saw the the role. He invited you over to read it. Did you have any doubts? I mean, what, you know, it's this has got to be a pretty big challenge. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say this is so cool. And I love that it's us four and uh, Poor Things, American Fiction, Oppenheimer, and The Zone of Interest are my personal four favorites of the year. So this is just great. Um, I think like Defoe was saying, you know, I think we're just all kind of like goofballs. And then like we have this whole thing that we do that's kind of serious and important. And, and I never really have a sense of, it's exactly what, what Willem said. And I think, um, I, I don't, I think about who's doing it, where's it shooting, who else is in it? Does it feel right? It's almost a way of pretending that the character and the work is, is secondary or tertiary. So my, so I don't attach my neurosis to it right away. And then as I, I had a little approach anxiety, and Chris was very clear that this was going, he would like me to tie both hands behind my back. He said, we're going to strip all the handsome out of you. It won't take yeah. <laughs> And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he kept going and kept going, but I'll tell you guys and why, you know, we've all had these kind of exceptional experiences this year. And, and Sterling particularly, dude, I just think the 
that that search for your character's authenticity i just felt it in a way that was so like i don't know i don't i just related to it so much while it being so different from my own life and experience anyway Thanks, um I just felt like I was going to trust him. And by the time I had a 70 millimeter camera with the lens this far away from my face and just that stillness, I felt like I was in some period movie. Um, I was like, oh, okay, this is gonna be different new. And I just have to, I have to get out of the way and try to just not do much, which is so counterintuitive. And it wound up being a, you know, a, a real singular experience. You know, that that's a good point that I think it can apply to all three of you. I see. Um, it's the best because you know the the uh, the art of stillness. I mean, e even Sterling, you know, you have that devastating scene with Leslie Uggams when you're dancing. Yeah, yep. you know, that's not comic. That is that is real quiet uh, stuff. Um, all done very internalized. And Willem, there's so many moments where uh, Godwin is just sitting and observing. You know, I mean, he actually is a kind of a still figure within the um, the Yorgos uh, Fantasia. I also will say, just real quick, the stillness with which the burp bubble comes yes, out. That's that exactly what I was thinking. It's one of my favorite things on camera this year. <laughs> <laughs> ah, good times. I'm sorry, can we just deep dive on that for a second? <laughs> when you oh. shoot that scene and you're asked, you're going, you're going to burp a bubble this, and it happens, I think, more, uh, several times. Three at least. I mean, that's just a trust exercise. You're like, all right, I guess this is going to come together in post. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But it sounds cool, you know? It, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it's the thing to do. It's, uh, it's, it's a definitely a color and very specific thing, and... It uh, defines the world and defines his way, and it's a fun thing to do. You know, I always respond to doing things um, more than uh, emotions, or uh, uh, you know. So I, I'm giving something really concrete to do, and my job is to make it the best burp possible. There you go. Well Get the best sound, and then, uh, you know, Post has to work with me to back me up. But maybe we can talk about the about because I think that when when we talk about stillness and acting, a big part of that is you're trusting the audience yeah. that they're going to uh, intuit things through the the. I mean, Robert, there are so many scenes where you're just sitting in a room or in a in a um, Senate hearing, and it's a long shot sometimes where we just see you among other people, but we're focused on what is going on. You know the, the molecular changes uh, there in your face. Uh, how difficult is that when the temptation is always there to push um, a little more? I mean, I, I think I can I can speak for the three of us when I say that you know it never fails to impress and remind me how little you need to do to be effective. Mm. And. Um, you know, we all have our our training and our histories. You know, I uh, I I watched uh, Kevin Klein and the way he would do his Alexander technique. I had two instructors for Chaplin, one named Johnny Hutch, who was the guy from the Benny Hill show, the bald guy that Benny Hill was always slapping on the head. He taught me a lot. There was a movement coach named Dan Kamen, but more so, I would watch. You know, I'd you watch what you do, and you'd realize these moments where you were just trusting the simplest version of expression and you go oh wow that's what the camera wants and the closer it gets the more it wants it so it, it's it shouldn't be counterintuitive because time and time again it's demonstrated that it's super effective yeah yeah, yeah. I, I, I never tire of watching someone actively listen on camera yeah. you know what i mean just being present to what's transpiring around them and taking that in is it, it is a way like sometimes when the, when things are happening you're like this and then when people go still you're like what right. and by the way this is a weird non sequitur but margot robbie's not getting enough credit uh in my opinion because america has this amazing speech and by the way she nails it i'm watching it and i go yeah. wow like that was a really tough one that's like a yeah. little one act play the whole movie hinges on it but it's the cuts away to Robbie so actively listening. It's it's yeah. when I realized, oh, okay, now I see Greta's really onto something here. But it really? was Robbie who had to trust 
that and it, you know let's let's not kid ourselves it's hard when someone else has the fucking two-page passage and they go all right now let's jump in and get bob and you're just like i've been listening to this all day no i have to <laughs> listen to it and make it work yeah you know i i well we're i want to uh, that's fun don't have to worry about nothing exactly. <laughs> and you know that, when you're talking about stillness I, n I never think about those things i really don't or about what's being maybe i should uh but you know i think the trick is to stay in stay in stay yeah. on what you're doing and then you don't even think about those things they sure. take care of themselves you know it's like uh a lot of people want to know the uh, the lenses and all that. I've been around for a while around cameras. I like performing for a camera. I'm conscious of camera, and I even like performing with the camera sometimes. But there's also a part of me that wants to forget all that, because whether it's close or whether it's far away, I'm doing what I'm doing. And when you get into this game to think about what's being transmitted, I think that's when you get in trouble sometimes because then you start to go to go to stuff outside yourself and you're, you're taken out of uh, what's going on and you're taken out of that experience that hopefully is so transparent that the audience is with you. It's you're not there. Uh, the story's going, the character is going, you're not there. And uh, I, I, I feel that really strongly. You know what? That's not surprising. I remember we shared a dressing room at the public theater. All right, right. It was right. Lori Parks play you were doing. Was it Mabu? Ma what was it? What was you were doing? It now? was uh, Richard Foreman. Uh, it was called Idiot Savant, and he used to have a very important, very seminal, very beautiful theater called the Ontological Hysteric in New York for many yeah. years. And so Willem does like 180 minutes of yoga every day. <laughs> no. And he would be just in the, he'd find a quiet theater space. That was then, let me tell you about now. <laughs> I've calmed down a little bit. But I, I'll say that, like, that in terms of just yoga, it specifically is one of those very moment-to-moment -moment things. If you think about trying to get to the end of it, you exhaust yourself before you have an opportunity to. And you just go from pose to pose to pose, and you breathe and you let the next thing flow from one to the next, et cetera. And so like, I, I understand what you're saying. I love to see the lens. I love to like, I'll step one second team is setting up. I'll take a look at the frame or whatnot, just so I have an idea of what, what am I working with in that particular space. And then I do, like you said, try to forget as much as possible and just be in the moment. I think when I was uh, younger, I, I consider myself still to be quite a novice in this game. There's two things in terms of what Robert was talking about before and, and in terms of approaching American fiction specifically. You have all these ideas that you want to throw out in terms of like, oh, I could do this with this character and that. And I find myself trying to essentialize. Like, you don't need that. Even though that's a tool that you could use, it's not necessary. Yeah. So put it away. Like, put it away and just try to come up with what's most essential to tell this person's story? Uh, I was I was doing a, a play at the Colonnades Theater across from the public okay. yeah, years ago. That play. Yeah. yeah. And I was the first on site every time. And my castmates uh, used to say, oh, Robert's going to Nirvana. And I would do some yoga. I would meditate. I would lay down. I did it kind of because I thought I wanted to be seen as doing it. But the truth be told is I was suiting up and showing up early and making sure that it almost felt like a pre-performance devotion. Sure. And I think that's something that we can all relate to is that's all the stuff that you do for the characters. One thing, it's also what version of you are you bringing to set day by day by day by day by day? Yeah. And I think that that's this kind of Cosa Nostra that's really, it's difficult to, to quantify. But I think it's a lot of what Willem is, is speaking about is it's kind of a, it's like a mindset even more than a, an approach, you know? Yeah. No, I agree with that. Yeah. What was part two? It's, it's going to come to me. Okay, let, you know, you ask your next question. If it comes to me, I'll, I'll throw it back in there. But. Well, I mean, this is somewhat related in a little bit of a way. I, I'm thinking to ask, because a lot of actors are going to be watching this, to ask about sort of navigating success. You know, I mean, Willem and, and Robert... Uh, they have... In the, in the 80s... <laughs> Um, Robert, you got an Oscar nomination when you were 26 or so, and... 26 when you did Chocolate? Isn't that crazy? 
<laughs> but Willem, you were in your you were maybe thirty when you did Platoon. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, thirty one, something like that. But I had a I had a great memory of, personally of being in a green room, and I think it was late two thousand and fifteen, and People versus O.J. Simpson hadn't aired yet, but I had seen some episodes, yeah. and I ran into you, Sterling, and I I knew that you were minutes away. Yep. I mean, you were just, it was right around the corner was going to be this enormous success. The Darden effect. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, in, you know, it, it, uh, it, it certainly was. What about those moments when you've got it, you've got some, some lightning there, and you've got to sort of make the right choices and be surrounded by the right people? You know? Um, yeah, these guys first, because I'm, I'm in the no, no. Nope. Uh, <laughs> Me? That's right. Yes. Oh gosh. Um, what can I say? Uh, I, 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 most of the past ten years for me has been like one of these does not fit with the others. Like this category that I am in right now with the two of you, with Mr. De Niro and Gosling. I'm like sort of pinching myself a, a little bit. It feels surreal to me because I feel I feel like a baby. Like I. I've been, I'm 47 years old, but honestly, I feel like a baby. Um, I'm not 47 years old and I feel like a baby. <laughs> <laughs> well played, well played. O OJ happened. Uh, and when I stepped onto that set with Courtney B. Vance and, and Sarah Paulson and Nathan Lane and John Travolta and Schwimmer and everybody, I was like, oh, one of these things <laughs> doesn't fit with the others, right? But the, best piece of advice I got is that you can't be a fan and in the game at the same time. So you give yourself a few seconds to be a fan and then yes. you get on the floor and you play. And yes. what did you recognize when people are confident in what they do and they have very little ego that they don't feel the need to haze you or make you feel small or less than it's when people are not secure that they play these weird games and you're like, I just thought we were doing a scene. But when people are cool, you're like, Oh, we're all here to tell this story. And that's what OJ was like for me um and then the editors would come up and they said like you know it's cutting together really nicely and you and sarah are really popping in the show and i'm like oh that's cool to hear had not prepared any kind of speech or did not think any recognition would come because i was like awards are for famous people i am not a famous person right <laughs> so then <laughs> you get the nomination and it happens and you're like well there's three people in my categories me travolta and Shrum are all in the same thing so we'll split the vote and somebody else will wind up getting it. And then other people start like winning in the show. And I was like, I went over to Paulson in at the Emmys. I was like, Paulson, who should I thank if I win? Right? And so she kind of whispers a few things to me, et cetera. Hey, when I won, on. the oh, gracious no. moment right. was people so stood up. Awesome. They give you a standing ovation. And got a standing ovation. I felt like I was received as a peer. Yes. Um, in a way that I never knew, it felt like just soul affirming. So yeah, that was that. I'm sorry, guys. I had a phone call. I didn't know how no, that came. My all computer. good. All it's good. It's better. That was uh, that was your eight year old in the room moment. I'm sure. Oh, there you go. <laughs> this is my eight year old. <laughs> but you know what? It, it, and and Sterling, you're so right on. And it, it it's that thing too of when you feel officed into the tribe. Yeah, it's not a haze. It's a we're holding you up because this is what was done for us. And now this is what we do. And you get this sense of continuity and goodwill. Yeah. And kind of like what we do is really hard. So we have this thing that we, you know, when we see it, we want to preserve it. And one of the ways you preserve it and, and that you continue it is by it's such a weird time of year, this, you know, celebration and all that. But it, I think it's a necessary part of this wacko religion we're all part of yeah it's it's nice to celebrate each other it's yeah. nice listen however that the award goes or whatnot is is one thing and there's there's ramifications from it or whatnot but to be in a space uh -huh. where people are not sort of like trying to best each other but like being like i saw you do that and that shit was pretty fucking fantastic like it's a good thing. it's a good thing. Yeah, and also it's so important. To, it sometimes it elevates the conversation about certain films that may be smaller films that 
but get be seen and get uh, to be seen more and that's driven partly by by your peers not only do you feel a sense of community if you're lucky enough to you know uh, be brought forward but this whole idea that it, it gets people talking about movies and the power of movies and it helps so much I, it's really important there's no way I can get ever cynical about you know the award season thing because it really helps it really helps to push things along I think are you going to talk about the tune though please <laughs> what do you want to know <laughs> well in, in terms of, yeah Joe go ahead well um, is there is there a story uh, about how you found out that you got that Oscar nomination for Platoon yeah that's yeah there is a story no just when I've talked about it you know there was such a different um awareness I think in the in the campaigning uh in the involvement of of um you know publicity it was less sophisticated then I think mm. because when I got um called for the uh to be nominated for Platoon I didn't even know what day the the nominations were being exactly. talked. And that's not because I'm cool and that's not because I didn't care. I just didn't know because it wasn't part of the system. Now, the next time that I got nominated, I was very aware of it, you know? <laughs> And I, and I, you know, I was nervous the night before and all that sort of thing. So that was just a, a case of it developing. But, but the, for Platoon, my son's babysitter called me up early in the morning and said, hey, man, you got nominated. It was pretty cool. It's really great. And then I remember very well, I went to work at the theater and it was very early. I was opening things up. It was like early in the morning. And I saw Jonathan Demme. Uh, may rest in peace. Uh, and he heard too, and he congratulated me. It was sweet. It was sweet. Yeah. yeah. So they yeah. did. They didn't post nominations on the uh, Wooster Group uh, cork board. <laughs> uh, dude, I just got to pause and say, to sorry. You, <laughs> My they were dad, into other things. <laughs> yeah. My 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 dad, uh, Bob Senior, used to try to get in movies once in a while so we could get SAG dues, so we could get insurance, right? So Friedkin yeah, yeah. gave him a couple days and to live and die in L.A. I know that very right. well, and I was very happy because I was a huge Putney Swope fan. Okay, so that's that's how I knew that movie was coming out, but also the Wang Chung soundtrack. I was pumped, so I was going to see it, yeah. and then. Yeah. I'm introduced to you for the first time where you redefined it was the first hipster villain I'd ever seen and it like created this whole new neural pathway in my mind and then there was a point in New York like a couple years later around the platoon time might have been no I think it was even before that where I you were just walking I was in Soho and you were walking down the street and I literally like bowed up and kind of like I, I didn't and I wanted to make all these stuff so <laughs> I think another Thanks. crazy point and something Sterling, as you'll see, as you get longer and longer in the tooth, yeah. there are these beautiful moments that sustain us where we realize that we're connected and connected and connected and connected and connected in just innumerable ways. And we take our comfort in that. And I, I think you're starting to feel it already, but that's the sweet stuff, you know? Yeah. And I also think that we're all here as supporting actors. I mean, what could be better than to be a force multiplier who doesn't have to be the department head of acting yeah, yeah. and the pressure's off. So in some ways your best, best work comes out because oh. you don't have all that added, you know, stress. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, that's a, that's a great point because there's a, there's a sort of a main narrative in all three of the movies where the lead character goes on, if you will, uh, an adventure. I mean, literally in poor things, but, uh, is that, I mean, Robert, is that challenging as well because you are only seeing the the sort of keyhole that you're looking through? It's almost like, I almost feel whenever movies are made, it's like it's like you're seeing all the ingredients for a great meal, but you're just seeing the, the eggs and the flour. And uh, do you, maybe I should ask this way, in all three cases, you all have seen the movies. What was that experience like? Because uh, these are beautiful films in their own way uh, that you play, you know, as as we say, a, a supporting role in and important. But um, what, when you saw Oppenheimer, I think, did you go to, did you do a screening in Sag Harbor, Robert? That was, yeah. Well, I'll tell you, the, the first time is Nolan calls me and uh, 
and Susan Downey and says, come to the IMAX theater at City Walk in Universal. <laughs> and it's him and I, Emily Blunt, John Krasinski, and Susan, and we watched the movie. And it was like that old Maxell tape commercial where the guy was just his hair blown back, you know, in that in that <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. that chair. And it was over, and we just we were just kind of gobsmacked. And you realized, okay, in this instance for me, this is what this guy does. He is a cinema trailblazer. And you just go, okay. And it kind of did this rainbow reset, not just on my career, but my whole kind of like existence. And I think when you have these seminal moments, and I would say that American fiction is a, you know, it is a, it's a reframe of a, a genre that had been misinterpreted and reinterpreted and poor things to me is a, I mean, it's just a, it's, it's so good that it's almost like you got to watch it nine times to really get all the juice that's coming out of it, you know? And I think that it's, it's, it's those things, you know, but anyway, and then later, because we had to walk off, as we know, speaking of SAG, we, we, we struck and we had to leave the red carpet and, you know, we were in solidarity and Chris required that we were, and we would have been anyway. So I didn't get to go to the big Lincoln center premiere that I'd been telling everybody was going to be so fabulous. And it was my little coming out party, you know, cause we like, we like to party. And, um, and so instead I, we wound up getting this, uh, this theater in SAG Harbor that had burned down and Spielberg and Baldwin and a bunch of people rebuilt it. And it was the only time I've ever sent out a RSVP list that everybody said yes to. Yeah. And they all came and I got to see it with a bunch of my peers in Sag Harbor, our home away from home on Long Island. And then it was on Long Island and it was fantastic. Yeah. Cool. Cool. I, would, I would say just in terms of being supporting, um, I, you know, you read the whole script and you know what the story is and then you know your character and then I think you also figure out how does my character fit within the story. And so for me, I was like, I am someone that Monk has to contend with, right? Like in order for him to make his full sort of arc, he has to like sort of deal, and these brothers have to deal with each other because they have been sort of estranged and out of each other's lives. And so as more things build up, like Cliff is supposed to be something that Monk is also sort of trying to wrestle with, like how come this dude just won't get with the program? He sees what's happening to our mother and he's just not, he's being incredibly selfish. So that was fun. That was fun. And in terms of supporting, like oftentimes when you're at the center of something, you're the person that has to hold it together. Um, and then when you get to support, sometimes you're the person that the person who's holding it together has to try to pull into the frame, right? And that's, that's kind of fun, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, one of the things that I, I like so much and makes every project unique is you kind of get there, you look around and you say, what are we doing here? What do we have? What are we shooting for? Who's going to do what? Who has to help with what? That all becomes very new. And it's not so much a process about measuring. It's all about falling into place, you know? So I'm never conscious of those relationships sometimes, whether you're leading the charge or whether you're supporting, it's uh, that becomes all part of the reveal, that becomes all part of the adventure. And also it's very conditioned by how the film is shot because sometimes films are shot in sections, you mm -hmm. know. For example, in Poor Things, we were tied to a particular location. So we really started out with my stuff. So I had no consciousness of my, you pl uh, for me, I'm not very good with the overview. I play a scene and try to play it with integrity and hope that when they put them next to each other, it'll flow and make sense. I don't, I don't posit anything to pay off later or vice versa. I can't do that. Some people are very good at it and they can do it in a sly way, but I can't. So um, it's, uh, I, I just want to, uh, that's, that's the pleasure always of figuring it out each time to see what the dynamics are and see where you can contribute. Yeah. And that's uh, the, the principal performer or the supporting performer. It, you know, it redefines itself each time. You don't, you don't, don't have a go-to way of being for each. You don't classify and then say, okay, I got to lay back or, okay, I got to drive because it shifts around. And sometimes the supporting person has to drive for a little while. Yeah. So it's a, it's a mixed bag, but always a good game. 
You know, there's there, Willem. There's one other anecdote that I love to hear you tell, uh, and this is gonna. It's very illustrative for all three of you to talk about tools that you can use. And because um, Robert mentioned to live and die in L.A., but I I love Wild at Heart, and oh, yeah, yeah. the that you played yeah. is called Bobby Peru. And if yes. you can tell us about what, because you know what I'm getting at, but it's the I think I, think I do because yeah, to yeah. tell you it's a kind of go to story, but I'm happy to tell it because it's go to story for a reason. It means something to me, you know. It's you know David Lynch was very direct. There's a supporting role and one of the most gratifying roles I've ever played. It's it's the smaller role but beautifully written and a real pleasure because it tapped into my imagination. It's the role that did it itself. I did nothing. It happened by itself. But how it happened was triggered by external things. I think this is what you're talking about. Yes, yes. I'm like, he handed me a hanger with my costume and says, here's your costume, Willem. And then he says, we got to get you to a dentist. And I thought, dentist, what, what's that? <laughs> Are they going to fix my teeth? What's going on? And he said, we got to get those dentures because it's written that he has stumpy, bad teeth. And I just, once again, an actor putting limitation on himself, I thought they're gonna have, you know, make him dirty, they're gonna funky him up. Well, David had in mind these dentures that went over my teeth. So I had them made, we put them in, and I couldn't close my mouth, because they were, so you're like this the whole time. And I'm telling you right now, <laughs> Sterling, Robert, do this. And you feel really lascivious, like you're going to well, bite something or suck on something, you know, and, and you feel like a bad guy, you know, and that was the trigger. And you're, I, those, the, when you find those kind of triggers, it fast tracks you to something that you can't even access normally. Sure. And, and when you find them, it's beautiful. And it's usually usually by accident or someone else's wisdom, and they turn you on to it. In this case, it was David. But that was beautiful because that really made me feel like Bobby Peru and really made me feel like someone else because I couldn't access normal things because this was such a strong physical sensation. You know, Robert, the, I'm curious to ask you about kind of looking in the mirror when you were making Oppenheimer. Uh, I also... Um, grew up on Oliver Stone's work and the character of Wayne Gale in Natural Born Killers with that Australian accent. Well, I'll never, it's unforgettable. So, so a, a tool like that. But in this case, seeing yourself, I guess there was something kind of done. It, it's it's subtle, actually, because you're recognizable um, through it, but but it's, it is someone else in a, in a way. What was it like seeing yourself and and not really seeing yourself. Well, I honestly loved it. It was this kind of just little blessed realm that I dropped into for a certain couple months. Um, and basically, you know, we just grade my hair, put my hairline back, and then they'll come in with an electric razor and just shave all the areas between the things. So maintaining that kind of hair loss look, because, you know, Oliver's like, no bald caps, no prosthetics, none of this, blah, blah, blah. But it's still going to take about two hours to get you ready. So you're in the chair at 4.42 a.m. because you start shooting at 7 a.m., literally start shooting at 7 a.m., and you're done 7, 7.30 p.m., and you're basically shooting for 12 and a half hours. So it was like, it it, it took the back seat because the the experience was so focused and intense but again, I could tell like Chris had such a clear vision of what he wanted it to not be. So he kept kind of not limiting. He just kept kind of removing things. But he was so specific in a way that usually would have driven me nuts about wardrobe. And it has to be this yellow, the yellow tie. Trust me, the yellow tie. <laughs> and I'd be like, I mean, great. All my usual, you know, give an actor too much leverage, it's going to like just destroy the equanimity on any project. And in this case, it was like, I had I had about like three decisions to make during the whole shoot. But then he would also let you play. So I think we're also all talking about, and I'd love to hear about just our, you know, y'all's experiences with your directors. Mm -hmm. and there, there, there's no experience of how you do it unless it's with that. But 
the long and short of it, I've, I was, once in a while I walk by the mirror and go, ah! <laughs> oh, right, 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 right. It's, uh, we're just shooting a movie. My, my kids were weirded out by it. My missus said, well, I'm seeing the future, and uh, <laughs> I accept it. Wait, Joe, before we move, I have to ask this one of, of uh, Robert. Uh, Tropic Thunder is, is one of my favorites, and it's one of my <laughs> favorite performances. How, how were you not scared out of your blanking mind, like, doing it? Like, were you? Were you not? Were you like, ah, oh, shit, I'll, why not? Uh, my mother called me and said, Bobby, I'm not long for this earth, and I'm telling you, do not, Iron Man hasn't, do not destroy your career. <laughs> and yet, this is the same mother that was, we were watching All in the Family that used to have that preamble that said, this is in the context of making light of this thing, yeah. which is appalling and needs to be addressed. We laugh at it so that we can laugh it away. So, yeah. I knew that we were just about to exit the age of rationality for what intent was but i also i couldn't resist the possibility of being black for a summer and my dad had had to revoice arnold johnson uh, for just because it was just like bad sound quality in putney swope that's my dad yeah. doing the voice of the lead yeah. actor and i remembered that and i remembered you know when you live on the East Coast, you're in much different of a melting pot than when you come out to California. So my, yeah. my whole upbringing was, it was so accessible. And then it was a mask, you know, we love a mask. I mean, Jesus, Willem, I mean, one of the great, one of the great Commedia dell'arte performances of the last 25 years, you know, easily. Yeah. And the mask was so freeing. I just finished shooting Iron Man and there was all that hope. And then there was this thing of, I just needed to wear a mask and, and make fun of the emperor. I just needed to clown the uh, the the underserved area of actors are so fucking stupid. How <laughs> can we how can we send ourselves up to to be free to to say it ain't it ain't that deep, brother? You know. But I, I don't. I just want how many times my wife and I say I don't read the script. Script read me. And you got any tips? You got any tips? That that shit lives in the Brown household. <laughs> I, I th th thank you, boy. Thank you, thank you. A glowing endorsement. There you go. You know, uh, Robert mentioned directors, and, and really, we we could talk about Christopher Nolan and Yorgos Lanthimos, but Cord Jefferson is make this yeah. is a debut Man. film arrived, and no one can believe. I mean, uh, but uh, Sterling, what was that experience like with someone who had a clear vision? Yeah. He wrote it, it, it adapted it. Uh, he knew what he wanted to say. There's a there's a tone that has to be just right for um, satire like this. It can it can go really badly if the director doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah. Uh, what's what was that like getting in there with him and uh, you know making the movie with a with a debut filmmaker? Joe, I think he he had such a clear vision because he wrote the story. Like he, you hear him talk about reading Erasure, how he felt like somebody was writing his life, and then sort of his ability to adapt it for screen was second to none. I had such faith in him as a director because I knew the roadmap that he had laid in front of me. And even more encouraging was that he was willing to admit the things that he did not know and surrounded himself with wonderful producers with wonderful actors, I mean, Jeffrey holds that joint down in such a magnificent way. And he would let us play, right? He was not even so precious with his own script that like, if you have something in the moment that occurs and feels that adds and heightens and explores what's already there, feel free to do it. And he's also, everybody leaves the camera rolling for like, however long after the scene is over, just to see what you can come up with. And that's, I, that's probably one of my favorite parts is like, how do I stay in character without any words that are there? What would this dude say if we just kept going? And he did that a lot. So ultimately, I think 87% of what I said was what he wrote. And then there's always like a, you know, 13 or whatever that's just like, I'm pulling it out of the old behind and see what, what sticks. You know? <laughs> like, oh, they kept that shit in the movie. That's cool. <laughs> You know, as as we uh, get closer to wrapping up, I uh, th again, this, this is a thing for actors to to watch and to learn from. So I am curious to ask about uh, about self doubt. 
or or nerves. You know, we're living in 2024. Uh, there's these are anxious times. I mean, Willem, I know you live in Rome. It's anxious everywhere. You know, um, what? What? Correction, he lives a little bit outside Rome. I've done my okay. research and talked to some of his co-stars. God, he's, you Bro. fucking figured it out, didn't you, Defoe? Uh, Jeez, you know. Christ. <laughs> different different pleasures, different prom, uh, problems, you know? Right. It's always that way. Huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what, what, what uh, I guess everyone's looking for the you know, for the magic pill. Well, I guess, Robert, you mentioned beta blockers at the Globes. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, I, I've since been very self-conscious about taking them unless I thought I truly may require them because I was like, hey, man, I'm also kind of the poster boy for recovery here. I can't be uh, trying to find your next dependency. I assume. <laughs> I would say this when it comes to doubt, the antidote to doubt is maniacal preparation. And I think that it's gone slightly out of vogue. It certainly did with me for about a decade. Mm -hmm. And yet everything that's old is new again. There is no, there is no replacement for if you woke me up in the middle of the night, I would know my name, rank, serial number, and the entirety of what was expected of me for that work week, backwards and forwards. Because there's knowing your dialogue and then like lowercase k, which is fucking bullshit. And then there is knowing it all caps yep. and being in it. So, you know, back to basics. Yeah, I, I agree very much. Um, you know, uh, I think about, I think about uh, for one film, I trained with this very good trainer, uh, Teddy Atlas to box. Oh, yeah. And uh, when you get in there, you know, he'd say, do what you did in the gym. Do what you did in the gym. And I always remember that. You do, you can make adjustments, but be ready, you know, have something up your sleeve and then be loose enough that you can go another way. But have the base. Don't wait for it to happen. That's one of the gifts that I got from the Wooster Group. Sometimes we'd work on stuff during the day and we'd perform at night. There wasn't a preciousness. You didn't wait for it to fall into place. You had to do, do, do. And then when you get there, you you have if you find, have to find a new path, you have to find a new path. And the other thing I think about when you talk about doubt is everybody brags about, oh, I'm always scared, and that's great because that means I'm alive and I'm still happening. I'm not cynical, which is true. But I think what happens is after a while you do it, and you make friends with that fear, mm. and you say, oh, I I survived this before. I like this. I can you so you go towards it. You don't push it away. So it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing to wake you up. It gives you energy, I think, to have that kind of natural doubt and fear. And then ultimately, if you really start to, you know, if you if you start to concentrate on what you've been working on or what you what your intentions are, everything drops away. You know, everything melts away and you're in it, and then that carries you. And you may get on the other side and say, oh my God, what did I do? But there's a fluidity and there's an intention that's clean, that's, that's, that's honest, and uh, you know, you've left that up behind. So I think it's really important to get in movement. I've worked with some young actors sometimes that want it to all happen when they're there. No, you gotta you gotta bring something to the party and then see what happens. Yeah, yeah. I just say I'm I'm down with uh, maniacal preparation, dogged repetition, uh, making friends with the fear. I think that the only thing that I have to add to it is, I'm I used to be sort of obsessed with how am I going to do it, and now I'm sort of like just really in love with why I want to do it and letting oh. the how sort of like inform me a little bit later. Yep, sounds good. That's what you call a mic drop, in case you're wondering. Well, that's, <laughs> that might be a good, a good place for us to wrap up. But, you know, the uh, you, right. three, you three have not worked together uh, no. as actors. No, I barely know these guys. I, I, I've i seen Robert through the years in Sterling. I think I only met you recently. In yeah, past, besides that, true? Besides I mean, I know you to work. But, I would watch you do yeah, yeah, yoga. Thing. I'm like a fly on the wall watching them do yoga. I'd literally be in the... <laughs> in the theater 
I was like, man, this guy goes for a long time. He hits it hard. <laughs> oh, um, but I mean, really, really getting to know you. Really getting yes, to know you, huh? Yes, sir. I look forward to it. If we can do anything, it would be an honor. <laughs> right. Truly. Well, I mean, I mean, that's the thing is that the, none, none of the three of you are are slowing, maybe slowing down, but there's no, there used to be a time in, in filmmaking where actors would retire at 65, you know, someone like Cary Grant, uh, that's, I mean, that, that's not happening anymore. And I think that the three of you are not, have no interest in checking out, you know, of, of the gig. Well, I think the question is only for me, really. <laughs> no, 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 come on, These guys bro. aren't old enough. These Check guys aren't old enough. I'm the senior one here. <laughs> um, no, it's not happening. In fact, you know, you're always afraid that you're just going to get lousy roles because, you know, the, the, the true stories that we're telling are often about middle-aged people, you know, so uh, you're worried about being... Uh, relegated to, uh, you know, weird uncles and uh, fathers and all that sort of thing. But I'm finding if you, you know, there's there's lots of stuff to do, uh, so far anyway. And uh, I'm turned on. It's a good period. And I'm, uh, yeah, it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. Yeah. Uh, it, look, all, all it will stop. <laughs> but uh, you know how that'll go. <laughs> You'll see, you know. <laughs> I, I would say that. Uh, under. Yeah. I'll leave last word for Sterling, but I would say all omens are good. We have the actor who has defined a generation, Bob De Niro, relevant as ever. We're yeah. kind of here in the middle to the the upper side of uh, not too young anymore. Gosling is on fire. It's like an airport, you know, some coming in, foam the runway, soft landing, some st stuck on the ground ready to take off. Others just been circling forever, watching the chaos on the ground. and dipping down once in a while it's uh and this is why i'm so pleased to have done this today because you know at the end of the day what we really are is we're we're, we're kind of company guys we're artists to a certain extent but you know this doing this for for the screen actors guild today to me was like oh it's kind of feels like coming home because that first glass ceiling that bar to entry is can i even get into this club can I even keep up my dues? Can I can I even say with a straight face that I am an actor who's in a guild and I'm represented and and I've got backup, but also I kind of made it. I made it. There's a chance. Cool. That's that's pretty good, mic drop, dude. I no, <laughs> do I have anything to add of any sustenance? I love what I do. I think we're all in the category of we get to, we don't have to. So when you get to, it's just like, I can't wait to do it again. My brother's a pharmaceutical salesman. I was like, bah, like that sounds like just the worst thing in the world. And he- Oh can't God, I would have loved him back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you poo poo the pharmaceutical salesman. A lot of his stuff has to do with like a heart disease and whatnot. I don't know if it's exactly what you were looking for. But uh, when I talked to him, my brother, his dream is to be a barbecue sort of thing. He has like this big egg and he'll slow roast for 24 hours. Like, so his dream is one thing and practicality got in the way and responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. And so he does something that he has to, to support and to, I'm so thankful that I was silly enough, young enough to say yes to this thing that did make sense to everybody else, but sort of made sense to me in my mind. I was like, I can, see it and I understand it and it doesn't matter if anybody else doesn't it's just something that compels me to move forward and when you have that sort of thing I just want to do it as long as I possibly can yeah yeah listen it, this has been terrific and I and I that the goal was that it be about the kinship and not the competition and I think that that's although I should mention that the the in terms of the Screen Actors Guild Awards the winningest of this group is Sterling you have four. There we go. <laughs> Why you gotta put in boy on a box like that? It's funny, they're over there. They're on my little books on the side. Uh, and there's two of them are for ensemble, which I uh, it's for yeah, Black yeah. Panther yeah. and for for This Is Us. And I, I'll tell you, and I two are for individual, but the the ensemble one really like moved me in a way that like I couldn't anticipate because 
I've had a nice little run of things and I got a chance to get up there by yourself and celebrate. But when you get a chance to celebrate with the team, that's that's a pretty good feeling. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's also just great. I mean, it, with with, uh, with the strike uh, resolved, um, ah. that there's been this opportunity, you know, Willem, you've been with your co-stars, uh, many of whom are also, and, and Robert too, are getting nominated for everything. Uh, that, that, that camaraderie with your... It's great. So, guys, this